I'd like to introduce our presenter for this afternoon, this morning. Um, it's Roberta Woodrick, Woodrick. She's the Assistant Conservator in Conservation Services at the KU Library. And she was undergraduate in fine arts. She has a master's in museum studies. And she's worked in libraries, art museums, and historic homes. So um, she says her, one, her current position allows her a wonderful opportunity to work with both circulating collections and rare and archival materials at Spencer Research Library. Roberta? Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me OK? OK, very good. Um, before I get started, uh, Pat sort of got me started off there. I thought I would talk a little bit about what it is that I do, where it is that I work. Um, before I get started, uh, Pat sort of got me started off there. I thought I would talk a little bit about what it is that I do, where it is that I work. Um, I work in a, a lab, a conservation lab, where we take care of general collections and special collections materials. So I'm basically the general collections conservator, which means that the kinds of materials that I work on, and these are books, maps, pamphlets, um, anything that you would find in a library. So the kinds of things that I'm working on, I'm very interested in the content and I'm not so interested in the preservation of the whole object. My boss is the Special Collections Conservator, Whitney Baker, and she works with our rare books and manuscripts library, the Spencer Research Library, and she also works with us, and we have her most days of the week in the lab with us, at least for part of the time. We're what's called a hybrid lab, and what that means is that we work on both General, coll general collections and special collections in the same space. And it's really nice. It affords us an opportunity to be able to have a lot of really nice conversations with, with Whitney and be able to use her for what, what we are doing. And so that's a very helpful kind of informative thing. And part of the reason that I say this to you all is that I know that you come from very different backgrounds, and I don't know that any of you are conservators. Some of you may be or work in any kind of preservation field, though some of you might. I know that you have a lot of different kinds of things that you're doing and that your facility, your institutions, vary in size. Um, I work for the state, uh, so we have, you know, we have a lot of bureaucracy, but, but I also have access to a lot of resources, and I keep that in mind as I'm talking to you all because I know not all of you will have that. And all of this is to say, um, Sometimes I think people think that conservators are coming and saying, you shouldn't do this. Why are you doing that? I can't believe you're keeping it this way. And that is not at all what we are about. What we want is to be able to educate people to give you a really big toolbox to be able to dip into so that you can think, in my institution, this is what's going to be important. This is what I want to focus on. And so today I've tried to be really general because I don't know really what your backgrounds are. Um, as I'm going along, if something you're like, what is that? I've tried to keep the jargon out, but sometimes jargon is just the only way to talk about certain things. If you don't understand something or if you have a question, just pop your hand up or just start talking. It's fine with me. I, I, you know, I feel easy going about the whole thing. All right, so you have all different kinds of collections in your institution. You may have manuscripts or letters. You may have books and photographs. Um, you may have something like an old yearbook. This is, I think, the yearbook for, I think, Yale, actually. This is Yale's yearbook. We just pull these images up just to give us something to talk about and look at. Scrapbooks, lots of places have scrapbooks. Um, and so, so, thinking about all the different kinds of things you have. And then, of course, all of you have records. We all have tons and tons and tons of records that we're dealing with. I know that your basic job might be something like a records management person. And so that's what, that's what you always have in the forefront of your mind. And you're really concerned with content. Or if you are a director, you might be really concerned with how is our public face? How are we using our collections to promote our public face? People in education might as well. When you put on your preservation hat, your conservation hat, what you're really thinking about is the object itself and the environment for the object, you're really, I mean, we, we're concerned with content, but content is one step back for us almost always. And we work with curators, we work with records managers, we work with archivists, and all those kinds of people, and we want all the kinds of input that you can give us. We work with curators at the Spencer Research Library a lot. And their, their input is invaluable, but as my boss always says, we're like the front line for the object. And so, I mean, this is just my wallet, so. <laughs> but 
when you put on your preservation hat, that's really what you're thinking about is what's going on for this. Maybe not so much what's inside of it, but how is it, how is it kind of hanging out in the world? All right, so the, th the four areas that I'm gonna cover today are physical space, the actual physical space where your collections live, the environment, that's a place where you're able to have, sometimes really for not even a lot of money, you're able to have a really nice impact on your collections. Disaster planning and response, this is something that is uh, oftentimes gets kicked to the back because it can seem so overwhelming to take care of. Um, but I was uh, part, we had a, a very major disaster at KU in one of our libraries this past summer. And I can tell you that planning was integral to the success of that um, response and salvage operation. And then storage and housing is the last thing that I'm gonna be talking about. But before I really get started, there's a few things that I want to say. Remember that you don't have to do everything at once. This is so, it's so easy to get overwhelmed when you're looking at your collections and you have, we have a main library, a research library, and seven branch libraries and a cold storage off-site place. And it's so easy to start thinking about all that stuff and just feel really weighed down underneath of it. So try to remember that you kind of have to pick and choose. What you have to do is prioritize. You need to prioritize based on the mission of your institution. So whatever your collection policies are or whatever it is that your, your institution is about, that helps you to think these are the things we need to focus on. For example, for us, it's our rare books and manuscripts library that we really focus on those collections because they're unique. They're rare. Sometimes it's the only one that exists like it. And so um, the importance of the collections, some things are more important than others. Things that are just on a retention schedule, like your different kinds of records and documents, you know, you just, you want them to be stable and stay for the amount of time that they need to stay and then move on out to however it is that you deal with disposal of those things. And then of course, resources available. And that is one of those things that sort of comes and goes. And right now it feels like it goes a lot. I mean, all of us are, we're stretched pretty thin, you know, with what we can do. And so try and see if you can't enlist the help of others in your institution. You can bring them on board if you can kind of invest them in something that's going on for you. Um, and then if you are the only person at your institution, which some people are, historic homes a lot of times really just have one person who wears all the hats. You might find people that you can use that are in your area, in your state, however it is that that works out for you. And remember that everything that you do benefits your collections. Even if you decide this year, you're, let's say that you are the, the jack of all trades at your historic home. If this year you decide the one preservation activity I'm going to do is get weather stripping and door sweeps and I'm gonna caulk up all my windows and I'm gonna put door sweeps on because that's gonna lower the fluctuation in temperature and relative humidity and it's going to help with pest management because pests come in the same doors that we do. That is a huge, huge, wonderful thing you can do for your collection. So just even if it's one thing that you do, that's great. That's absolutely great. All right, so um, the physical space. So this is just assessing the overall condition of your building. Um, I walk to work every day, and uh, it's about a two-mile walk. And as I, I come up the hill, because we're on a hill, in case you don't know about Mount Oread, it's a very, very steep hill. It's very flat, and then suddenly very steep. By the time I hit the hill, and I'm getting ready to come in the back door, I always come in the back door of my building, I am not thinking about my building at all. I'm thinking about the day. I have eight students. I have a half-time staff member. I have a lot of projects going on. I'm March, March, oh gosh, oh I forgot that one thing. Oh, I gotta write that email, oh da 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 da. And you're not thinking about your building at all. It's not a bad idea a couple of times a year to just have a, have a little walk around your building. Usually we like to do ours in the spring after you've had a lot of weather. And then again in the fall when you've had the leaves have fallen and you've got sort of buildup. And this is just walking around, and these are general things. You may have, you know your building, and I'm not writing every single thing down that you have to do. This is just to put into your mind ideas of things that could be helpful. So is your roof in good condition? Because something that we have in Kansas, well, certainly we have in Northeast Kansas, is rain comes kind of, you know, it comes at an angle, never straight down, and it comes in gallons and gallons and gallons, right? And so we have a lot of leaks in our libraries not because, and it's sometimes it's not even because the roof is in bad condition, it's just the rain is coming in at an angle that you could never, the, you know, the people that put the roof on could never have imagined. Um, 
are your gutters situated so that there's good drainage away from the building? This is something we struggle with with several of our buildings, and we try to keep up on that. And we let our facilities people know when we've noticed that, because we have some very tall buildings, and when we notice that the gutters have been kicked out and the water is just literally draining into the foundation of the building. These are kinds of things, and these are preservation activities that we do, that we engage in. Um, the landscaping, you want to make sure that if you have landscaping that is pulled away from the building enough that you can get back in there and that facilities people can get back in there to fix things. Um, and then inside your building, you want to note where your air exchange vents are and where your lights are, especially in your collections areas and your exhibit areas because um, that's where light exposure and then the temperature fluctuations with your heating vents, those are the kinds of things that you might not be able to move your collections. We certainly can't. We have collections that are in places that it just, it's kind of frightful where they exist. But it's the way it is. I mean, we're cramped for space. Practically everybody is. And so, um, but sometimes there are things you can do, like have those, the things that angle the air away, you know, that makes the air blow not directly on your, on your, on your collections. Um, just different things like that to be aware of. And then the other thing that we try and preach to everybody is get to know your facilities and your housekeeping staff. They are your friends in every way. They know your buildings in ways that none of us ever will. They know every nook and cranny of the buildings, and they see things on a daily basis that you might not see because it's just not in your mind's eye to see it because it's really not part of your job. They're great people to know. They can be a, a wonderful asset to you. If you have after hours people that come in, they may see bugs that you don't see because the bugs come out when the lights go down a lot of times or different kinds of pests if you have pest kinds of problems. We do. <laughs> um, and so it's just, it, and the other thing is, is that I, we learned this firsthand. I mean, you, it's one thing to know it, but it's another thing to learn it firsthand. If you have a really large scale emergency, your facilities and your housekeeping staff are going to be on the front line with you, working through all the kinds of things that are going on, and knowing them beforehand was, for us, was such a great asset because we were really able to establish, well, we had established relationships, so we were really able to call on them, and they felt comfortable letting us know what they were seeing as well. And so that's all I really have to say about your, kind of your basic building ideas, but these are just good things to do. So we try to do this a couple of times a year. And it's a nice walk around the, the building. So environmental considerations. So uh, these are things that probably a lot of you know, but just in case, it's maybe a review, I don't know. Temperature of 70 degrees and relative humidity of 50%. These are the two, these are the, the two best places that you can be where your collections and you can exist and cohabitate in happiness because most of us are pretty good with that. It's an ideal kind of environment to coexist. Now, a lot of collections that are cellulose-based or that are so paper and wood and then a lot of other things that are susceptible to fluctuations, they, don't, they would really like it better if it was like 50 degrees and 30% relative humidity, but unless you just have a dedicated storage space for that, uh, that's really not going to exist because none of us would be comfortable in that. I mean, you'd, you, know, you, would just, you would freeze to death. We do have a place like that. But let's say that you are somewhere that you don't have an HVAC system, all you have is window units because of, you know, whatever it, the place that you're working in. What's really more important than hitting those two numbers is trying to avoid fluctuations. So if it has to be 72 degrees and 53% relative humidity in your space, that's okay if you can hold it at that because the real issue here is that most things that are cellulose-based, they love water. And so they want the water to come into them. And as the humidity goes up, they bring the water in, especially paper and wood in particular. Then as the humidity falls, like maybe in the evening, it goes out. Then in the day it comes in, it goes out. And as that goes on, that flexing, that expansion and contraction over time, the material stops being able to do it. And it stops, and then it becomes brittle. That is, a, that is one of the reasons that things become brittle or really hard or crusty, you know, how wood can get really kind of tough. And so if you can keep it just at a steady state, then you're holding it in a, in a, in a better environment. So, so like I said, I mean, those are ideal. Certainly in our building, we do not have that, but we just try and maintain a steady state in the different buildings that we have. Um, something that's kind of helpful is to even find out what you have going on so you can monitor the various areas within your building to kind of get a sense of what the conditions are. So a, a more low-tech way of doing that is to use um, just a thermometer and a hygrometer. You can, those are things that you can purchase. 
some other things I brought along because I thought I might need some things for people that haven't seen these kinds of things. This is a PEM. It's a meter that reads, ours reads uh, temperature and relative humidity. Uh, and it just constantly circulates through and reads these things in, uh, I think, Fahrenheit and Celsius both. Uh, this is put out by IPI, which is the Image Permanence Institute, and that's a really good resource for even finding out about these kinds of these kinds of things. But you can get these. I mean, you can go online and find them. And then something else that we use are data loggers. Our data loggers look like this. They're just these little units. Ours take uh, humidity and temperature, but you can have them test for mold. Some are sensitive to different kind of light considerations. And then um, it's a little cum cumbersome. They're still working out the kinks on this. I think eventually they'll get it. This is a shuttle. And so these sit out in our stacks. We have, uh, I think we have 35 of these in all of our libraries across campus. And once a month, um, one of our staff members goes with the shuttle and the shuttle just connects through a little cord to uh, the uh, data logger. And then she can pull the information off of here and then go to each site and collect all of the data. And then she takes this back, and this interfaces with a program that's set up through this particular system. I mean, there are different ones that you would find. Um, so that she can download all the information. The nice thing about what the system is is that it turns raw data into, uh, into uh, reports that look like graphs, and graphs really are helpful with administrative type of people. They like the graph that shows, oh, look at this line going like this. You're like, holy no, we've got to make this stop. It's much more effective than just saying, well, it's really hot in there. I mean, I think that they're like, so what? You know, it's hot up in my office too. So this, this will be, now you all can, when, after I'm done talking at you, you can, you can come and have a look at those things. If you've never seen them before, they're very interesting to see. I will say, just as an aside, something that uh, IPI has been trying to do that they haven't worked the kinks out of, and we're all really hopeful that one day they will, is to have um, the, uh, the data logger wireless. They figured out how to make them wireless, but the issue is, is that I, certainly this is true for us. Most everybody, our collections are stored in places that have gigantic, thick concrete walls. And so there's really no way for the information to ever, you know, you just want to sit at your computer and have it like come up to you, but that so far that hasn't happened. I know that the Dole Institute got some, um, some wireless ones because they want, well, they had the money to do it, and they wanted to try it out and see how it worked, and they had real issues with it. They, they literally still had to walk up to the data logger with the computer and get the information that way. And they didn't have to plug it in, so maybe that was like a little bit of a time savings, but we're hopeful that they can uh, move on through that. So some other kinds of things that you need to think about are light levels. You can get a UV monitor. Usually, I don't think that they're that expensive, but I'm not 100% sure. And if you know another institution that has one, we have one of the only ones on campus, and people borrow ours all the time. They just come and they, they send us an email, we need to borrow it, they come and they take it and they bring it back. So, um, and uh, there's easy things to do. You can have UV filters on your lights or on your windows, especially in your collection. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, did, did the plastic from Lowe's say that it was a UV filter? Okay, because I think that even home repair places can sell stuff that is because everyone's aware of that. I mean, I mean, the general population is aware that UV light can be damaging to things that you have in your home, your couch or whatever, right? Um, I think that your best bet is to find someone with a monitor that you can test and see what your UV is, because it's possible that it's perfectly fine. Um, if not, then probably the sleeves that go over the lights, I mean, that's what we have, is the sleeves that go over the lights. But even then, you always want to be careful about those. You want to make sure you get them from a reputable dealer, because the state purchased some for us that ended up almost catching on fire. It was really quite a fiasco, and so those have all been replaced. But it's like, you know, you really do have to, that it's, it's, they did not engage us in helping to find the filters <laughs> because we would have been really researching and calling and that kind of stuff. They just went for low bid and they kind of got low bid. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was kind of strange a couple of years ago. So if you can get that tested, because it may well be, I know mine, I just don't know. And they make films for uh, Windows too that can, that can work really well, so. And then if, if possible, try to avoid storing your materials near windows or security lights. And I know that isn't always possible. Sometimes the best you can do is, especially with security lights, we have an exhibition space in one of our, uh, 
in one of our libraries that has security lights because it's near the front, and so we just have covers for the exhibition cases that we throw over at night because the security lights are on all the time. And that kind of stuff, over time, it really builds up. It ages things quite quickly. Um, pests are another thing that can really, that's an environmental concern. Um, so it's helpful to initiate an integrated pest management system. And that's just a fancy way of saying, get some traps, some sticky traps, put them in places where you know that you might have pests coming through. Let that kind of percolate for about a month or so. And then look in your traps. I know it's kind of gross, but look in your traps and see what you have. Because the first step is finding out what kind of pests you have at all. For example, our lab has silverfish like you would not believe. Now, the reason that we have silverfish is because we have a wall that we share with a mechanical room, and it's always very, very humid in that mechanical room. And so silverfish love, they love dampness, and so they come under the wall. So we treat with boric acid, we put boric acid down along that wall, and that really has stemmed the tide a lot. But knowing what you have helps you to know how to treat what you have. And this is another place that's good to enlist your facilities people and your housekeeping staff because they know about that. Um, initiate a no food and drink policy in collection processing and storage areas. This can be a very unpopular thing at the beginning, but once you get it going, it usually works out pretty well, and you will see a significant drop in pests if you have them, if you can keep people from eating and drinking in the processing areas and the storage areas. We just recently went through this as well. And then another thing that, that what I talked about earlier is if you install door sweeps and weather stripping around doors and windows, like I said, bugs, pests, they come in the same doors and windows that we do. That I mean, they're going to take the path of least resistance. And so uh, just having those kinds of things can make a really big difference. Yes, sir? Did, did, what, did, what did that person indicate? Did they say they can't? Yeah. I don't know. It, that's, a, that's a really good question. So why don't they just make lights that have UV filters to begin with? You know, and lights are changing right now. We have all of those, you know, the, the really new kind of CFEs and, I mean, just all these different kinds of things. I think light is something we're still kind of working a lot on. I, I wonder, I don't know, I wonder if there were enough people within the museum world, archives, libraries world that said, hey, wouldn't it be really great if we could do something like this, if you all could be producing? I mean, we might be able to make something happen. I don't know. I mean, so far as I know, I've never heard of a light bulb that came UV filtered something has to be installed. That's right. That's right. As time goes on, you do have to change them with time. It's not a permanent fix. That's right. That's absolutely true. Um, so when I talk about water, what I'm talking about here is if you have areas that are prone to having leaks, for example, we have stacks areas where we have flat roofs and there are places where the water just comes in, it's a good idea to drape plastic sheeting um, over those shelves or whatever you have going on, because sometimes you, you, even with the roof is fixed, you still have leaks. We certainly have that. We've had two, uh, on our main building, we've had two major additions, and the seam lines where the additions have gone in are places where it just, the, it just is like a waterfall. And we can't, we don't have the space to move the collections elsewhere, and so we just, uh, there's a lot of plastic sheeting around in those places. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing in the world, but really it saves your collections a lot. And of course we haven't had rain much in two years either, so we, we haven't dealt with that quite as much of late. Um, and that's, you know, whether you, uh, sometimes, and we also have a H, an HVAC system that leaks periodically. So that's something to be aware of, just to know where are your leaky areas and kind of check in on them. So emergency planning and response. Uh, this is actually a picture from um, our, uh, we had a water main break at our art and architecture library, and um, this is just a picture of the expanse of water. I really can't say enough good things about emergency planning. <laughs> um, so, establish an emergency collections response team. Whether you're a team of one person or ten, it doesn't matter. If you're the only person there, then be the emergency team. Let everybody in your institution know that you're the go-to person. It's very helpful to be, to have a point person that everybody can talk to, that everybody can come to and have questions for, especially before anything happens. And we hope that nothing ever does happen, but in case it does. Create a realistic timeline for updating your emergency plan. So this one is, this is one of those things, it's like, Plans can be huge and bulky and kind of boring to put together and that kind of a thing, you know. Um, and so when you're thinking about doing this, think, uh, we, we started updating our plan in 2009. 
we ran into quite a few kinds of hitches for, a t for two years. We had hitches of just even getting things rolling. Then in 2011, we started working on it in earnest, and it took us about a year and a half. But we had mapped out, you know, first we want to work on this, and then we want to work on this, and then we want to work on that. And saying all those things, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Go online, find peer institutions to yours, and look at what emergency plans they have listed. A lot of places, a lot of really big, like for us in libraries, we went to Harvard, Columbia, Yale, um, Duke, uh, Notre Dame, big institutions that have access to a lot of money who are going to have top of the line plans in place. Those are really good resources for you to think about which parts of these can I pull out and use? Because no one's gonna care if you do, that's perfectly fine. And so having said that, I brought a, this is our, this is the hard copy of our emergency plan. What we have in here are, all of our branch libraries are in here, and they have everything from who it is that you would need to call and get in touch with. There's tables of contents for each thing. And that's why if you go online and you see what other people are doing, it's so helpful because I wouldn't have even known where to start with this kind of a thing. And then how to deal with specific things. And it gives you a guideline, a baseline, so that you know what's going on. It's always good to have a manual for these kinds of things. So that's, um, so that's our emergency plan. And this is our, this is the hard copy of our emergency plan. What we have in here are, all of our branch libraries are in here. And they have everything from who it is that you would need to call and get in touch with. There's tables of contents for each thing. And that's why if you go online and you see what other people are doing, it's so helpful because I wouldn't have even known where to start with this kind of a thing. And then how to deal with specific things. And it gives you a guideline, a baseline, so that you know what's going on. It's always good to have a manual for these kinds of things. So that's, um, so that's our emergency plan. So thinking more about, so make a pocket plan. Pocket plans are fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful things. I have a pocket plan in my wallet. I carry it everywhere I go. My pocket plan, I don't have a pocket plan for every single institution, or I mean every single library. I have a pocket plan for our rare books and manuscripts library that I carry with me everywhere because, because that is the place where we have our unique collections housed. If something is to happen there, then it's really, that is going to be a huge emergency. Oh my goodness, I just shudder to even think about that. Um, so I have this, it has the, column, the main calling tree in the middle here, and then different kinds of people that you would need to be calling. And then on the back there of this one, we have all the staff that works at the Spencer Research Library and their home phones, their cell phones, whatever, whatever way we can get a hold of them. And I will tell you that calling trees are really fantastic and work, and, and work well as long as you keep the phone numbers updated. That is, and that can be a challenge. You just kind of have to, my uh, counterpart, uh, Kyle Cedarstrom, he is in charge of that, and it's sort of this ongoing thing for him. I feel kind of bad for him. But it's, they're very, very helpful to have. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. 
so the suggestion is is that if you pick a day like May Day, which is all about emergency preparedness, and just say, this is the day when we're going to make sure that we do the updating, then that is, uh, that's a really good idea. That way you know you're getting it every year. So, yes, that's right, at least once. Um, create an incident report. So we have enough water leaks. I mean, this is probably telling of, you know, telling too much on KU, but it's just the truth. And I mean, I think these are helpful to know that it's like there's no point in keeping a secret about these things because everybody has something that's going on in their building. So we have an incident report and there's everything there from who found it, what it was, how long it took to take care of it. Um, it, we, we include pictures a lot of times if we need to. Any kinds of recommendations you might have. What did you do? How did you follow through? And the really nice thing about the incident report is that you can keep it on file and you can have a history of the kinds of things that you've been dealing with. And when you find that in the year you've had 15 incidents on one of your particular areas, it's a lot easier to take those in to your administrators and say, isn't there something that we, can't we shift a little money over here? Because this is a lot of staff time. You can show, we spent 14 hours this time, we spent 25 hours this time. I mean, you really have some hard evidence, and that's one of the great things about the incident report. And they're really easy to do just in the moment. I mean, you, you can have, I mean, we've had students fill them out who found stuff and started things off, and then you pick up where they leave off. I mean, different people can fill in, because we have it all on, on, online. And then emergency kits. This is something that's important to us because we're spread out. Like I said, we have a lot of different buildings. And so um, this is our emergency kit and the list of things that we have in ours. This is definitely one of those things you can go online and find super easily. Um, the main thing in our emergency kit is plastic sheeting because water is, our, is the biggest thing that we have for draping over things. But we also have gloves, a first aid kit, flashlights, um, Claws. We have a squeegee that goes with our kit. We have caution tape in case you needed to map something up or, or cordon something off. Um, I'm trying to think. There's just it's it's kind of packed full. It's kind of actually hilarious how much stuff we have in there. And ours is on wheels, so you can uh, drag it wherever you might need to go. So it has a little rope there so that you can uh, so that you can move it around. We have one in each of our branch libraries and three at our research library. And every year. I contact all of our liaisons at the libraries and say, has anyone pilfered from your kit? Because students do like to get in there and get scissors if they've run out of something or a pad of paper or whatever. So things do get just pilfered generally. And we account for that. I mean, that's just sort of the way that it is. And what do you need for us to refill? And if, if, they, if they have something that they deal with, because of a small thing, they can deal with themselves because we've given them the ability to do that. And we'll still go over and check on things. But it's, it is super helpful to have a lot of people out in the field to help you with your job. So this is the last thing that I'm going to talk about today, which is storage and housing. So improperly housed and stored collections can lead to damage and loss. So we have all different ways that things might be stored, and sometimes they just get lost in, in, the, in the great heave of what you have, and sometimes things can just be damaged by poor storage, and you actually lose the item. The item itself just crumbles into bits. So these are just some examples of different things. I did not actually take this picture, but I did. I, uh, I do some pr uh, private work every now and then, and I did have uh, the opportunity to work on a collection that was like this. These are records that were stored in a basement, and they're fluorescent with mold. I mean, so getting stuff out of basements and, and, uh, is, is always a good thing, if at all possible, or at least up off the floor. These have been palletized, so. And then there's water damage, of course. Um, it can damage the covers of things, and inside, if it, were, if it were stapled, like this was, you can see it's not just stained, but the staples themselves had rusted. And then this is a, an example of something that's so brittle, I'm pretty sure that that, is, that page is from that, um, that you just have actually lost the material. So improper s storage, and also the environment, a lot of fluctuations in the environment can lead to these kinds of losses. Oh, and then, um, so this is sometimes when you have donations from patrons, they will have, uh, you know, put four-leaf clovers, things like that in there. It'll leave a stain. People love to put newspaper clippings. Like if they happen to, if their grandfather wrote that book, and then there's a newspaper article about their grandfather writing that book, you, you all this to say you want to try to get those things out, not necessarily to throw them away, but just to get them out of where they're being stored, and maybe you can make a nice photocopy of that newspaper and then store it with the book and then throw away the really acidic piece of meat. 
Uh, and there's, there's a lot of adhesives that very well-meaning people have used to try to fix things. But the problem is, is that the carrier, which is, so there's the adhesive, the sticky substance, and then the carrier is the plastic backing or something that's made out of some type of a plastic. A lot of times, as the adhesive deteriorates, the carrier becomes very hard and can cause a lot of breakage. And some adhesives are actually acidic themselves and literally eat through the paper. And then the photograph over there is um, someone I think had used some type of rubber cement and you can see that it had actually leached up through the photograph. So what we try to say, say to folks is, if you're working on your collections, try to avoid rubber cement. That's really the big one. Avoid rubber cement. Elmer's glue, there's a lot of really nice, more archivally sound glues out there, jade is a brand name of one, um, that just, that work really well. And then lamination, because lamination uses heat, yes ma'am, jade, J-A-D-E. It's a brand name, it's a type of PVA, which is polyvinyl acetate, but jade is one that, it's uh, one of our students actually did a research project and found it to be quite stable and not very acidic, and so we're, we're really, it's, uh, there's a lot out there, but jade is one, and jade is one actually that you find a lot of, uh, Places that do, like art centers that do a lot of craft things will use jade. So it's, it's reasonably priced too. And you can get all different sizes. So you kind of paint it on rather than squirt it on. And then lamination. Please try to avoid lamination with anything that you have. Uh, you can't reverse it because of the heat and the, um, but there, there's an alternative to lamination that works and that is very much reversible. So we just, we try to caution people just to try to avoid those things. Um, so when you're thinking about storage, uh, shelving, you, if you are thinking about purchasing shelving, um, you want metal and you want powder coated paint, which means they've hung up the metal in these big rooms and they run an electric current through it, they spray paint into the room and the electric current causes the paint to adhere in a way that it will not chip, it will not flake, it will not degrade, it will eventually wear away, I suppose, but those are the ones that you really want to go for. Um, you want to try to get ones that are the correct depth and to support the boxes or the materials that you have. And if at all possible, and this one makes me laugh because there's nowhere in any of our buildings that this is true, but if I had it to do all over, um, six inches off the floor is great because most pests are not interested in going up much more than that, maybe some spiders, but a lot of things, they just see that and they just go on. And then if you have any kind of water, standing water, usually you will have found the issue before it gets much above six inches, although not always. Um, I'll tell you. And then cabinets and oversized cabinets is the same kind of a thing. Uh, something to look for with cabinets is if you can get internal hinges, which means when you close the door, the face is flush. There, you don't see the hinges sticking out. And that's because um, if someone were to want to steal something from your institution, internal hinges make it virtually impossible for them to break in without really just cutting open the door because they can't pop the hinges off. And then lockable if that's something that's important to you. Map cases are super great. We have a, a there's a supplier here, a manufacturer here in Topeka, whose name I tried to think of all the way over here today. I usually know it right off. Did you, did someone say they knew what it was? Oh, I just, I will think of it though. Um, and you can get them right here in town. It's really nice. We just got 12 of them actually, uh, 12 stacks of them for our archives, our university archives. Um, again, metal, powder coated paint. Uh, internal fabric covers are really nice and I'm gonna step away from the mic. Um, I, I had never seen them before. The ones that we got are the first time I've had experience with them. They're really nice for keeping everything nice and sturdy, I mean nice and steady. And then that they lock in place when they're open. These drawers are huge, like this deep. And so it's nice if you have the kind that when you pull them out, you pick them up a little bit and they go over a hook. And that way when you lean back into it to get to something, it doesn't just roll back in because that's really frustrating and can damage materials. And then the last storage thing is rolled storage. That's really best for textiles. Um, they're really great for being able to build in site, I mean on site, having some type of a facility person or a construction company come in and build them so they custom fit. And the really great thing about rolled storage is that it's just stacked, you know, usually floor to ceiling. And so you can use spaces that you might not be able to otherwise use. So if you have a wall, and you don't want a wall that's right next to the front door, not like that kind of a wall or in front of a window. But if you have a wall that's say at the end of a bunch of rows of things and you have enough space that you could have about 12 inches sticking out, it's a really nice way of being able to store things. 
Um, and just also being able to access rolled things, having them hanging in that way is super helpful. And then different kinds of housing. Some of you have seen these things, I'm sure, but I'm just throwing them out there so you have an idea of what is out there. You can get these from, and I'll, I have some suppliers at the end of this. Um, there's flat and oversized storage boxes and flip front record storage boxes. The thing to remember about these is try to get boxes that fit what it is that you're putting in there. And if you're putting folders inside of boxes, make sure that the folders fit the box, not the item. So if you have all different sizes of items, you don't want to have a teeny tiny folder for a teeny tiny item and then a great big folder for a great big item. You want all the folders to be the same that fit in the box and then the items can go inside the folder. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Steel Fixture Manufacturing Company. Bless your heart. Thank you so much. That's great. Yes, they're great. They're very reasonably priced and they're really heavy. So the fact that you could just have them ship from Topeka to Lawrence was, it saved us a ton of money. It was really good because the other manufacturers are, you know, uh, even if they don't cost that much, the shipping is just is deadly. Um, if you have a lot of prints and you have some fun, it's really nice to mat them. Matting them helps first with stabilizing um, the image, but also it makes handling it really nice because then you can just flip through things. That's a nice, a nice option. Yes, ma'am. So boxes for folders versus file cabinets. Um, I think, let's see, let me think about that for a sec. We certainly have, I would say we have more boxes. I'm thinking in particular about our university archives because our archives has just so much records. But we also have file folders. I think as, again, as long as the file folder is fitting the space, I can't think of a reason that that wouldn't be just a fine storage environment because it's in metal, much like a map case. Um, if it, right, as long as you, exactly, as long as you have acid-free folders, exactly, it's dark. I mean, it's, it's an enclosed environment. So that's a really, really good question because, but I, I can't think of any reason that that would be a bad storage and I wouldn't move stuff into boxes if you have a perfectly good file cabinet I would stick with the perfectly good file cabinet for sure also that's easy access for you know a, a, what four or five feet so it's, it's cer certainly helpful with that and they're easy to store too that's a really good question but you could if you had shelving because we're always trying to come up we or you could even build shelving where you take out the bottom shelves you slide your file cabinets in to where the, they would have been, and then you have the shelves over the top of that, whether you stack them. I mean, we have to be inventive because we are so constricted by space, so yeah. Because you don't want, you'd hate to lose that extra, what, four feet of space, so. And then these are just other different kinds of options. Um, down in the bottom here and then on the right and up is mylar. So mylar is a really great alternative to um, lamination. You can purchase through all the kinds of archival companies, these things called L sleeves. L sleeves, why didn't I bring one? I don't know. They're fantastic. It's two pieces of mylar that are put together and they've w been welded on two edges so that you can flip the corner over and slip an item in. And one of the interesting things about mylar is it has a slight electrostatic quality to it. So whatever you slide in there, even if it's something that's two pieces, it's fragmented a bit, once you slide it in there and position it, it really will stay. It's not gonna budge, it's not gonna slip around, and that's one of the really great things about L sleeves. Then when you're done using it, you can take the thing out, put it back into your storage environment, put something else in. We use them all the time for everything. They're great if you have a teaching collection and you wanna be able to use things that you m might feel a little bit, or you just don't want people to have their hands all over your, a postcard collection or a stamp collection or something that you're trying to have, have users be able to have access to, and they want to be able to handle it. Um, and I, I can tell you from experience, having encapsulated just, I don't know, thousands of things at this point, it can make the most delicate item that you could not have possibly imagine people being able to use, usable for your patrons. And there's something wonderful about being able to bring out this really old map 
and have your patrons really be able to use it and look at it. And so that's something that you can provide for curators or other people in your institution. We, we have curators, we just give them piles of L sleeves and say go to it because they know how they want to use their collections. And so it's, it's a nice thing to be able, and they come in all sizes from teeny tiny to really great big and you can trim them down, they're great. Um, something else is you can get in sheets. Um, LBS, which is Library Binding Services, uh, sells in sheets. Uh, 60 pound is the paperweight in sheets, and we use them a lot. That's what you're seeing right here. And they're really thin, so they don't take this take up as much space as say a file folder would. And if you had several things in one envelope or in one file folder that you might not want to be kind of commingling, you could put several in sheets in there with things inside of it. And then newspaper boxes, just they're really great. They exactly fit newspapers if you have newspapers in your collections. Um, well, yes, there is. It's, okay, what we have is an encapsulation machine, which it's a sonic welder that actually welds the thing closed. Without having access to that, something that you can do, but I would do some experiments before you really went this route. But something that you can do is um, 3M makes double-sided tape that's very, very thin, like seriously, an eighth of an inch wide. But I would try this out just to experiment to see, because as things shift in there, if, if they do shift, usually they stay still, but if they shift, you don't want it to be running into the adhesive that between the two pieces of mylar. But you certainly can take that and just you know put two little strips up in that loose corner and tack it down because it peels away, you know, you can with some with some exertion. But in terms of sealing it up, you would have to have some type of an encapsulation machine, something, some kind of a heat. They make encapsulation. Um, it's not a machine. They make a bar. I don't know. I think this is a very expensive piece of equipment. It's not very big though. Maybe as big as this podium that has a welding bar that you can press down, kind of like like at the dry cleaners, how they you know have that bar that presses down. Um, but I don't, I've never had experience with them. I've just seen them online when I've been looking at other things, so. Oh, that's true. See, I don't, so smaller ones for food packaging. I don't know if that would, you, but it's really, if you had a food packager at home, it would be worth getting an L sleeve and experimenting and seeing if it worked. Because that's what we do a lot of. We do a lot of experimentation. No, no, it's, yeah, because that, that machine is crazy. Yes, ma'am. Right, and so the, so the statement question was, do you leave some air around it or do you leave a little gap? And a lot of times, even when we're encapsulating, we leave a little gap, so. Right. Yeah, yeah, because it is sticky, it's super sticky, yes. E-N-D. In sheet like for a book, they're actually literally in sheets for bookmaking, um, and they they come folded, and they come in all sizes. And LBS um, sells them. You know, you can buy ten, you can buy ten thousand, and they're great. They're really really great. And we use them for in sheets, and we use them for exactly this purpose. So, okay, so this is a great debate that nobody has ever really been able to. A lot of conservators have done tests on this. So there's this idea that if you seal it all the way around tight, you've created a micro environment. If there's any moisture, if there's any acid, if there's any anything in there, have you sealed it up in a tomb, basically? And so that's so, sort of the concern is, have you made it, have you ziplocked it but created a place where mold could grow or where the acid could, you know, really be intensified, different off-gassing, because some things, different kinds of plastics and things like that will off-gas, and so have you created a terrible space for it? And so sort of the idea is if you leave a couple of little gaps, you've given a place for there to be airflow. What contradicts that is that static is, is pretty staticky and it holds it, it hold, people have tried to do tests and no one has come up with conclusive evidence. It's sort of like, is it better to ride with the cars down, with the windows down or with the air conditioning on? Does one save more gas than the other, right? No one's really been, it's, it's, a, it's still 50-50. In fact, seriously, last week my boss was talking about it because someone was asking her and she's like, I know people who have done tests and no one's 
So I think just to be on the safe side, pretty much everybody leaves a little gap just to be on the safe side because you don't want to get down the road and find out, oh, shoot, we should have been doing that all along. So, yeah, I know, it's funny. The, the hot topics in conservation, right? The things that keep us up at night. Um, so then photographs, you can put them in sleeves. Um, and then the picture down here, it's white. White on both sides. So you would, this would... Then um, if you have slides, of course, slide sleeves are the really best way to store them. You can see everything that's written on them. You can add little notes if you need to. So those are just, yes, ma'am. So yes, you, you, you can, um, so there's different ways you can find out. One is most manufacturers are very sensitive to these kinds of things these days. So let's say you go to Michael's and you're looking at the three ring, three ring plastic sleeves. Um, you can see who the manufacturer is and give them a call and say, is this acid, you know, is this, is this polyester, let's see, polyester, poly, oh gosh, you know, I'm just having one of those brain days, but thank you, right, is this, right, thank you very much. We're avoiding PVC. You know the stuff that smells like a beach ball or a raft? That's what we're avoiding. So no PVC. If it's polyester, any of those other kind of vinyls, mylar, that's stable. And yes, of course you can use those things. That's not a problem at all. No, not a problem at all. You're right, because the, the companies like Gaylord and Talos and places like that are very, very expensive. Yes. Oh, good. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. And Gaylord would always be the, the group I would say go to first. There, and Gaylord is they're, they're our, who we always check first. They have very competitive prices just to begin with, and their customer service is fantastic. They are great. They will look up anything for you. They will help you figure out anything that you need. They'll call you. They always call you back when they say they're going to. I, I can't say enough good about Gaylord. That's always, that is always who we first check. So these are just some things to remember, just to kind of, yes, please. Mm -hmm. That's perfect, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. That's great, that's stable. Boxes, the thing that you really, the thing that we're trying to help people to think through is you just don't want them kind of hanging out in the open air, you know, uh, in a file stuck on a shelf somewhere, but where you have it, it's, it's inside of the sleeves, so it's nice and flat. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's great. And that way you can also see the back in case there's anything written on it, because a lot of times there is. Um, and then you have them in binders, and then you've got them stored. Where did you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And then what do you have those inside of? Oh, yeah, perfect, exactly, perfect. And so then they're in the dark. I mean, that's the main thing that photographs want to be is they just don't want to be in the light. Yeah, yeah, they're great, they're great. And you can see them really well. The nice thing about what you're doing there is you're providing, you have access, you can see what you have, and you don't have to actually touch the physical object. You can touch the thing that's holding the object, and that is super important. Oh, when they're handling the photographs, yeah. like in the hundred pack. <laughs> They're so inexpensive. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Bare hands. Clean, 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 clean. Really old paper. Really old paper that is, and this is hotly debated, but, but my boss comes out on this side, so I just say what my boss says, you know, that's the way that that works, right? She advises, now newer paper or stuff that's really stable and photographs for sure, and things, you know, like statues that are metal and things that are wood and things where your fingerprints really can leave a lot of residue, you want to wear the gloves. Photographs more than anything else, absolutely. With paper that is really toothy and old and tends to get caught on fabric, there's a lot of indication that we end up doing more damage 
overall, with a, with, especially with patrons who are unaccustomed to handling collections, or even if they are, it's hard to be as, as careful as you need to be, and your fingers will notice more quickly, your bare finger will notice more quickly, oh, I'm about to tear something, than you will when you've got the gloves. And so that's, uh, that's what we, I mean, that's what we do when we have um, curators come in and they bring some of their collections and they'll ask for gloves. We'll say, well, for this item, we really recommend that we handle it with our bare hands. Just clean, make sure they're really clean. Yes. Right, because, because that mimeograph paper or, uh, uh, right, onion skin, and then there's the, uh, the mimeograph makes me think of architectural drawings where you have uh, diazotypes and cyanotypes and different kinds of blueprints where there is a, that is, a, that is you have to, that one you kind of have to play by ear. We have an enormous, we, in our university archives, we have all the blueprints for every building and every restoration that's ever happened at the university. It takes up just, oh my gosh, you wouldn't. And they're amazing to see. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful collection. But some of them, they've been used on job sites. They're in really rough shape. They're covered, some of them have been, you know, covered in dirt and there's tape all around them. And because no one intended for, the guys who are using them are never intending them for the, the, them to come and be stored somewhere for then researchers or future renovations. Uh, when they do other renovations, they come in and they use these. So it's, a, it's also a collection that get used a lot. But some of them, it's odd because, especially with the blueprints, and they're very curly and kind of dusty and, it's true that you're thinking, do I need gloves or not? And that's sort of a judgment call, like you as the curator or the person who is maybe bringing this out to a patron might want to stop and look at it, touch it yourself with your bare hands, see how you think. Do you feel like that the patron could use that, you know, well, or do you feel like that gloves might be better? Because you can kind of tell just working around the edge a little bit. But that definitely is a judgment call kind of thing because it's so, it's so, I don't know. Is play it by ear? Yes, ma'am. Very little. It's a tiny, tiny, minuscule little burst of light. Um, if it's something, it's, it's, it's the prolonged exposure that really gets us in trouble. If you have something that is getting used, you know, you're getting 100 copies on it a day, then it might behoove you to do what we call making a preservation copy of the original and then use that surrogate as the thing that people pull copies from. But just in terms of, we tell people don't worry about that because the only thing you might need to worry about if it's a book is not so much the paper but the binding. If they're having to smash it down on there, you probably want to try to avoid that. If, if there's any way to have access to what's called a book eye, which is an overhead photocopier basically that you can open it out and then you can kind of angle it we have one in our interlibrary loan department. You can angle it so that it just basically takes a picture of that object. That's something, and there are different, I think different libraries probably have that if you, you know, if someone wanted to, if, or if you wanted to make a really nice surrogate copy using that, so. Yes. Oh, the heat set tape. Document repair tape. Yes. yes, yes, and it comes in different widths. Yes. Um, so, okay, we use we have document repair tape in our lab, and we use it on our general collections. It's a Japanese tissue that has some type of an adhesive that is a pressure sensitive adhesive, which means you press it down and it stays in place rather than having to use heat. It's one of those things that really you know, it, 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 it kind of rides the line. I mean, we, our map collection, our just general collections, map collection, we use, we use those kinds of products all the time for that because we know that those are gonna be used up. If you have something that's not gonna be used up, if you're really worried about the age of it, there's something about it that makes you think, maybe I don't want to do that because there is an amount of permanency to anything that's pressure sensitive. You might want to consult a conservator just to see what their thoughts were on that particular document. By and large, I don't, it doesn't, it's not, I mean, certainly we use it. It's not, I mean, we don't think of it as a bad thing. We think of it as one of those middle of the road kind of gray area things where when you have so much stuff, you have to deal with it somehow. And so you need to have some type of option of being able to make it work. 
Um, so, you know, it, it is, it's, like I said, I mean, we use it and we have, we have a couple of our liaisons that we have been trained on using it for their collections too. And so I, I wouldn't say no, just think about what it is you're getting ready to put it on. But if you have, you know, thousands and thousands of things, it's just, that's just life. And it's not bad. I mean, it's, it's pretty nice stuff. None that I can think of. I mean, again, if you're using, do you mean with a flash? It's um, it's such a quick, it's such a quick burst of light that it's not something that we worry about. We um, when you're digitizing your collections, which we're doing a lot of at our research library, certainly we're using a, a camera with a lot of really intense light on the object when the picture is being photographed. But it's just so short term. It really is longevity on those things that that wears them out. So. Um, so this is just a list of different kinds of things to think about when you're working actually with your collections. So anything like sticky notes, paper clips, get those out of there. You don't want those around your collections, you want those away. If it's possible to unfold and flatten without damaging the item, try to do that. Um, sometimes you can't, but it gives you more space and over time that fold line is gonna break. Uh, if you have newspaper, try to separate it out now, with scrapbooks, they're their own beast. If you have scrapbooks in your collection, breaking a scrapbook up into individual parts is, we try to encourage our curators to leave them be because the, the whole meaning of that scrapbook is tied up in the way it's arranged, all those different kinds of items that are in there. One thing you can do if you're really concerned, if, if there's a lot of newspaper in there, is you can remove the newspaper, make a photocopy, put the photocopy back in. That way you're, you photocopied it on acid-free paper and so you've got a nice surrogate in there that works well. But sometimes that can take away from the, like the flavor of what the scrapbook is. And so again, you know your collections, you know your mission, you know your patrons, you know your donors who gave you the scrapbook, you know what the, a lot of the intentions are in all of that. And so you know, just kind of keep those things into, in, in your mind. Um, always use pencils rather than pens, kind of. Um, and if you can provide a separate label rather than just writing directly on the item, that's always good. Um, and then here's one that we really are working on as we're some, some collections which we are starting to rehouse in our rare books library. So it's like you talked about where you have your photographs and sleeves. It's that kind of a thing where you're thinking about when you're rehousing something or e even if you're updating the housing that you already have. Um, if you can put adequate information on the exterior of what you have, that's a list of, there's 10 letters from Jim Smith in here, and there's you know, a list of his publications, and da da da, that way you can just look at the list rather than having to go in there and rifle around. It also helps if Jim Smith has given you 10 boxes of stuff, rather than having to look through 10 boxes, you can just look at labels. And another thing we do a lot of when we rehouse objects is we take a photograph looking down into the box, of what's in there, and then we put that photograph on the front of the box itself. One, that gives the curators instant uh, knowledge of what is in there, but the other thing is, is that sometimes it's a lot of little bits of things. Like it's, there's the little metal Jayhawk, and then there's three pins, and there's a little flag, and then there's like a little program kind of thing here. Seriously, I'm imagining one right now that I've recently seen. And so we had an, uh, one of our, um, one of our interns created a very nice housing for it where she carved out of ethafoam a place for all of these things to reside. So it's also helpful to the user when they take out this thing and then they're going, where did that thing go? Oh shoot, they can put everything back in and they don't have to worry about it. So we rely on photographs, we, we photo document probably in excess, but it's always better to have too many pictures than not enough because they're super helpful. I mean, they're really, really helpful. In, it's, it's the picture is worth a thousand words for sure. <laughs> um, try to, to house uh, similar size and weight items together. You're not always able to do that because some collections will have teeny tiny things and great big things. And so, you know, you, but if you can, try to, try to keep things together. And if something's really badly damaged or you have some kind of concern, you just don't know what to do, um, you can call a conservator. If you go to AIC, which is the American Institute for Conservation, their website lists conservators all over the nation who deal with every kind of, there are conservators, if you can name a material, a media, any of those kinds of things, there's a conservator for it, for sure. Um, and AIC, 
while we don't we don't have uh, certification, we have a code of ethics, and anyone who's a member of AIC is obligated to follow that code of ethics, and so you can find a lot of really good conservators. And some and uh, what a conservator will do is when you contact them. Um, They'll talk to you about the object. No one is just going to rush in. If someone wants to rush in and start working on things without talking to you, without documenting what you have, that is not the conservator you want. You want someone who talks you to death at first and makes sure you know all the options, all the costs, and who gives you a written documentation saying, this is what I intend to do. This, these are the outcomes I intend to see. And then at the end, they give you another document that said, this is what I did, and these are the outcomes that I had and gives you all of that documentation because that's part of the provenance of your object. Anytime something has been conserved, you've changed it in a certain way. It's gone from being in two pieces to one. And so that provenance needs to travel along with that object as it moves through history. Um, and I think, oh, so these are four of the uh, distributors that use things that we, we use all the time. Gaylord at the top. University Products is great for a lot of archival stuff. Uh, conservation Resources has all sorts of odd things, uh, like every size of box and folder that you can imagine, from just the tiniest to the hugest, and that's a place we go to when we're just like, I can't find it anywhere else. And then Hollinger, Hollinger's kind of expensive, but they also have some really nice, high-quality boxes if you have something that's very, very specific in a certain way. And then someone I didn't include on here, and I don't know why, is a company called Talus, T-A-L-A-S. Talus mostly deals in conservation, book repair, cons kinds, of, kinds of conservation, but um, they have, it's a, it's a family owned business in New York, and again, super duper customer service, and they have some very unusual items. If you were, if you were needing some kind of a tool, like a bone folder, a scalpel, um, those kinds of things, they have some really nice and usually reasonably priced things there. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so flattening is what really what the question is about. And this is something that you can do yourselves. Humidif humidification and flattening are pretty easy kinds of things to do. You can create what's called a passive chamber um, where you humidify things, you bring some moisture in, and then you flatten them. And so, I, I, sorry I do not have pictures to illustrate this. I will do my best to describe it. So let's say that you have a sink into which you put some type of rubber stoppers or feet, something that will hold up a, a screen, a lot like the kinds, well, they don't have them here, but you know those, it's the plastic squares, little plastic squares. You would get one of those to cut to fit inside your sink. You would fill the sink with enough water, not that it's touching that screen, but that it is, uh, you know, maybe a half an inch of water. You put the screen on top. Then you get blotter. And you can buy blotter at Michael's. I mean, any kind of art supply store is going to have blotter. You put a piece of blotter in there, and then you put your object in on top of it, and you put some kind of lid. What we have is just a piece of plexiglass that's a little bigger than the sink. We put weights around it, and then you leave it. You just keep going back and checking, and it's usually they're all rolled up. You just keep, and gently, gently, you let it flatten until it relaxes to the point that you think it's probably not going to relax anymore. Then you have a station set up where you have um, blotter, and then you have this substance that's, or this uh, material that's called Reme or Holytex. You can buy this at any fabric store, anywhere. You just want to get the kind that's not fusible. The fusible kind, what, what we use Reme for in textiles is uh, when you're making a quilt and you have that fusible interface that you iron on to give it a little bit of uh, kind of stiffness, not fusible because you don't want that chemical in there that's, that's causing it to adhere. So Reme or Holytex. And so then you just have layers. So your layers go blotter, Reme, object, Reme, blotter, Reme, object, Reme, blotter. So that the object is always between the Reme and the two sheets of Reme are always between two sheets of blotter. You can build up a pretty good stack. I wouldn't go much more than two inches, but you can probably get about two. Then a piece of plexi and as much weight as you can put on top of it. And by weight, I mean it can be canned goods, it can be bricks, we use bricks. You just, if you get bricks, you just go to the Home Depot or whatever, get yourself bricks or pavers, and then bring them into your house and put them in your oven at about 250 to let a lot of the moisture come out of them. And then we usually just wrap them in paper so they're not scratching up everything. 
you know, it's like a lot of, I mean, you, it's like, I mean, while I do have access to resources, we don't have limitless access, and ordering weights has got to be one of the most crazy things in the world to do, because how much are you paying for shipping? Never order weights unless you absolutely have to. There's a million ways to make them, and there's a million online resources of how to make weights with all different kinds of things. L lead shot is something else we use to make our smaller weights. So, and then leave it overnight, a week, a month. It depends on how wrinkly it was. Newspapers, when I'm drying them, doing exactly what you do, because sometimes our newspapers come in and they've uh, gotten left out under something that dripped all over them. So first I let them dry. To a certain point, I want them to still be a little damp. And then I wait them. Usually by the next day, they're flat as a pancake. So, so once you've finished your treatment, then you can just do that sandwich, plexi, wait. And then check on it, you know, just take it off, peek under there, see how things are going. If you feel like it could be a little flatter, put the weight back on, leave it another day. And that you just make sure that your reme and your, um, your blotter are bigger by at least an inch than what you're putting in there. Because what's happening is, is the moisture is wicking out, and then you want it to totally wick out, if you know what I'm saying. So you don't want the edges of your object hanging out. You want all the edges to be inside with a perimeter around. That's a really good question. Humidification and flattening is a great thing, and it's an easy thing to do. And that's another one. Look up online. People have come up with all sorts of creative ways. Like if you don't have a sink, there's these trash can methods where you have something in the bottom of the trash can, and you put the rolled things in there, you put the lid on, and then you pull it out, and you flatten it again. And it's never going to be p totally flat in the trash can. But for really tightly rolled things, I've heard people have had really great success with that. So. The only when I was when I was saying that before, when you are working on any kind of stuff, just make sure you're using a pencil because you can erase it, and you can't erase ink. In terms of what you have, ink is you know ink is stable in some ways. In some ways, kind of more stable than pencil because graphite can so easily smudge away. So oh yes, it's only when you're using stuff when you you know when you're writing something about it when you're documenting it. If you're not documenting it by typing, then any kind of thing always use pencil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are they wrinkly? Is that what you're saying? Or they're just, oh, okay. Oh, are they stuck together? If they're stuck together especially, contact a, a, a photography conservator, a photograph conservator. And um, there are, there's a couple in um, Kansas City. Tom. See, I'm really having one of those days where nothing comes into my, I'm sorry? Uh, she wants to have photographs conserved. There's a couple in Kansas City. If you look up, up Conservation Kansas City, the husband of this couple does, he, at least he used to, Tom used to do, uh, Tom Hedmanson, I think, used to do uh, photograph conservation. That's really the way to go with that because even my boss, who is an amazing, amazing conservator, is really, she only will do the most bare minimum thing things with photographs. Otherwise, she contacts specialist who deal with nothing because because of that emulsion layer and we've all been to workshops and I mean we can we can usually tell you what's going on but in terms of being able to treat it we're gonna say I'm sorry I don't have that kind of expertise because there's a whole set of, of things that go along with trying to deal with photographs yes sir y yes sir they got wet yeah. oh they got flooded well, thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate that so many people want to come out. And I mean, just in terms of the basic archives workshop, that's a really fantastic thing to avail yourself of. I certainly, I love all the workshops that I go to that are like this. So, and thank you all for having me. Oh, and I think my email address is somewhere in that booklet. So shoot me an email if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to, if there's something that wasn't clear or you suddenly think, oh, what about this or that? Just send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Brian Baird, he wrote a book that I believe is called something like Basic Preservation for Small Libraries and Institutions. It's that kind of a title. Brian, um, he actually set up our lab years and years ago. He's an amazing man, an amazing conservator. And it's, um, it's a really good book for he has a lot of different things in there, a lot of, he, he, ch he covers a lot of, and it's, but it's not very big, so it's not like you're just swamped. 
and he has a very kind of jovial writing style, I would say. And it's, uh, we use the book, I've used the book when I've taught classes just to kind of help people to wrap their minds around certain things. And he even gives you some very basic kinds of repair techniques that you can do. B-A-I-R-D, Baird. Thank you all again. <laughs>